We want to welcome you this morning, and we thank the drum circle from the Fort Erie Native Friendship Center for leading us in worship. Let us continue as we turn in our hymnals to number 678 and sing together for the healing of the nations. I will. Healing God, we come together in our brokenness to call you in your mercy to make us whole again. Restoring God, we gather to worship you, even as we hopefully seek to be renewed and restored again. Foundational God, we come to praise and thank you. In the depths of your holy being, we find peace and rest. Let's pray together. God of life, God of hope, God of all, let us, like eagles' wings, sustain us, guide us, Heal us, then send us forth into the world that we may love. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. 
Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, the power and the glory, forever and ever. Amen. I would like to introduce the combined choirs of St. John Stevensville and People's Memorial United Church. Thank you, choir. That was beautiful. And Val and Phil for giving leadership. It's been a fantastic weekend. 
For those of you who were unable to join us on Friday and Saturday, uh, you missed some very thought-provoking ideas. Um, I've just been blessed by the ministry of uh, Dr. Kuhncombe and by the fellowship and the um, joy of being together with brothers and sisters and gaining understanding. This has been a tremendous learning experience for me personally. And I would be remiss if I didn't uh, thank Cheryl because Cheryl was, this was her vision and I just got to pick up the ball and run with it after she went to answer the call to First Grantham and uh, I took the position she was in. So Cheryl, thank you for your vision and for moving everything into motion. We also want to uh, highlight a few of the announcements that are in the bulletin. We had a very successful night on Tuesday as the UCW had their benefit uh, dinner with Pathstone Foundation, and we were able to present $600 to that very worthwhile uh, mental health um, institution. A couple other things in the bulletin just to be aware of, uh, Nimble thim Thimbles on uh, April 26 at 9.30, choir practice of course on Thursday, and um, stewards meeting in two weeks, board meeting in two weeks. And what we all love to do as United Church members, eat. <laughs> May 13th will be our roast beef dinner. There's two settings, um, one at 5, one is 6.15, so make sure you get your tickets early because I believe they usually sell out. I think those are all the announcements for this morning. Let's turn in our hymnals together as we sing number 308, Many and Great Are Your Works, O God. <laughs> Brian Brown, and uh, I'm the Minister Emeritus of this church. I'm just uh, in this service uh, introducing some people and doing a few of those small things, and the first one that I will be introducing is uh, uh, Mrs. Kuhncombe, uh, Mary Ann. Um, we're so pleased to have her here with uh, uh, her husband, Matthew, and she's going to be reading the scriptures for us, but just to get a sense of what a very special couple this is. I, I heard a story. She doesn't know that I know this. When they, when they were in high school, <clears throat> um, they, they didn't date, they didn't go out, they knew each other from across the room or whatever, but there was one girl in the high school that was a little more forward. And uh, Matthew, uh, of course, all the girls were chasing him, and so, uh, <laughs> and so this girl said to Matthew, <clears throat> you know, you should marry me. 
And he said, and she was within earshot, he said, no, I'm going to marry her. <laughs> they didn't go out until days in university. But uh, that's to show you what a very special couple they are. Uh, they, they share commitments to uh, truth, reconciliation, justice, uh, share commitments to the gospel of Jesus Christ. And uh, we've asked uh, uh, Marianne to read the scriptures for us this morning. They may not be the ones in the bulletin because for his sermon, I believe uh, Matthew has asked and given her uh, other uh, scriptures. So there's a good live mic over there. If you'd like to read it from that uh, over there, right there, sure. Good morning. The scripture from Jeremiah 29, verse 11. For I know the thoughts that I think toward you, saith the Lord, thoughts of peace and not of evil, to give you an expected end. And I'm going to read from uh, Acts chapter 1, verse 8. And you shall receive power after that the Holy Ghost has come upon you, and you shall be witnesses unto me both in Jerusalem and in all Judea and in Samaria unto the uttermost part of the earth. Amen. And then I'll read from Romans 1.16. For I am not ashamed of the gospel of Christ, for it is the power unto salvation to everyone that believeth, to the Jew first and also to the Greek. Amen. Thank you. This is the very word of God. Thanks be to God. Well, um, the uh, children will uh, be addressed for a few moments, and the child in all of us. The uh, thought I have for the children and for the child in all of us is related to the symbol of the fish as a symbol of Jesus Christ. You sometimes see it on car bumpers and in different places. Even on the front of both the pulpit and the lectern, you see a fish symbol, and it says United Church of Canada in French, English, and in Cree, uh, which uh, is of interest today. Nevertheless, the fish symbol, how did it get to be a symbol <clears throat> for Jesus Christ? Well, the word, uh, the, the initials of the phrase, Jesus Christ, Son of God, Savior, are in Greek, the language of the Bible, I-K-T-H-U-S, which happens to spell fish. And so in olden times, as a secret symbol among Christians, when they were persecuted, uh, if you wanted somebody to know that you were a Christian but you didn't want to take a chance, you might draw with your stick in the sand a half a fish, just a And if the person drew the other half, you know this is in the Roman times of persecution. And so it was a secret symbol of Jesus Christ, the Son of God, the Savior. Well, we have a fish in this church, not just these on the pulpit and the lectern. We have another fish. It's a very interesting fish. And I'd like to share with children and the child and all of us how it got here. I'd do that today. This area was once populated by an Indian tribe known as the Neutrals. And they got that reputation or that name because they weren't taking part in any of the wars. Well, other native communities, just like in Europe, uh, Italians, uh, uh, Germans, French, and English were always fighting and killing each other in wars. Well, there was some of that in North America as well. And it happened that the neutrals who wouldn't take sides got caught in the crossfire between the Hurons and the Iroquois, and the, the neutrals disappeared, got eliminated. It's a sad story in a way, but when a people disappear, one of the things that remains sometimes is the place name. The people who replace them eventually remember the place name. And so you have place names of people who have disappeared all over the world. The name of this place was Zadum. 
And there were several places named Zadum in northern, uh, northwestern New York. They got misspelled and mispronounced by European settlers as Sodom because it was a more familiar sound uh, to them from the Bible. But the word is Zadum, and it means sacred meadow. And so this church happens to be situated in a sacred meadow from ancient times. And one of the ways that we're fairly sure that this is the site is that there is a fish here, too far, a, a fossil of a fish, too far from any of the fishing grounds that it just would have happened to have landed. It had to be brought here. And so it would have been used perhaps in worshipful ceremonies in this sacred meadow, this Zadum, which should be the spelling of the name of the road as we have it here. So I want to show some children, as many children. Are, are children going out to Sunday school today? Is there a program, I think? No. Yes? No? No. no. They're going to stay in. So to, for this little moment, I want to show them that fish, see if they can see it. Uh, if a grandmother or parent would like to come with them, if there are some children that would come up here for a moment, I'm going to show them. Can, can you bring up your hand? No. There's a guy. He's good, so this is a guy. All right. I've got him up. You, okay, here we have a few extra. Let me just don't want to make this awkward for May if everybody doesn't want to come, but I'd like you to come up here with me. All right. Sure. Come on right up. Come on right up. All right. Now, you see that rock up there? That rock is a fossil. That's because a fish lay down in it, and eventually his bones made an imprint in the sand. And then when the sand got hard, we could see the outline of the fish at least his bones. You're the next guy. Come over here with me. And you look up in there. Can you see the bones of the fish, the imprint? All right. Okay. So, okay, you can all see it. That's a fish, not, not the overall size. So you can see the, the shape there of the bones of the fish. And when European settlers came to this area, they found this fossil here, not down by the shore, and it had been brought here, obviously, for recognition of the Creator and, and the ceremonial uh, worship, which we in our own way continue through the symbol of the fish, which is for us, Jesus Christ. And so what a wonderful coincidence, except maybe there's no coincidence. God knows these things in advance. Thank you. You can be seated now. That's a First Nations religious symbol which, properly understood, points to Jesus Christ. Uh, we have a special welcome to First Nations folk who are in our midst today and some who have been with us over the last few days. We would be delighted if you would see this as a place where you might worship more often. You could even bring your drum on special occasions and we would welcome you worshiping here. We're ready to introduce, uh, I'm, I'm, I'll make a comment first uh, about the art exhibit and then I will introduce Dr. Kuhnkamm uh, for those who have not heard him or met him yet. This congregation also ha has, it's just full of treasures and one of the treasures is the Morning Star Gallery. And the gallery is an art gallery and it often sometimes spills out into other parts of the building. If you visit the art gallery today, you will see some of the work by Gwen Plyley, an artist originally from this congregation. And we left some of those in for today to give you a sense of the gallery. But most of the work on display today is from Aboriginal artists, mostly of some fame. We're rather proud of our collection. The most famous of all is Carl Beam, the Governor General's award-winning artist of 2005. His name, Beam, has some connections in this community. Uh, he was adopted at one point and took the name of the Beam family. And he has been here and uh, uh, guided some of our work in establishing that in Nookshuk, uh, just outside the door, which you probably have seen. 
I had the privilege of doing the funeral for Carl Beam uh, later in the year after he became the Governor General's award winner. But there are other tokens of his work. Three of his students in the Manitoulin School of Art are Brian Marion, Richard Bedwash, and R Ron Neganosh. And we have collections of their work, which you will appreciate, I'm sure, as we join together uh, eating and drinking uh, with the Native uh, American, North American foods. There are two bits of other artwork there that I want to draw to your attention. One is, in your, when you're in the gallery, there's an exit door to the street, and right beside it is three artworks by a Métis artist by the name of Michael Robinson, and his work is the favorite of our uh, gallery custodian, and we draw his work to your special attention. But as you're going in from the hall to the gallery, just as you're entering on your right, but still in the hall, is a marvelous medicine wheel by Anne Beam, the artist wife of Carl Beam. Uh, we won't have an opportunity to describe these things to you, so I took that moment to give you a little orientation to the artwork that you will see following the service today. So let me introduce uh, uh, Reverend Dr. Matthew Kuhn Kam, and you know, I stood aside for a moment while his writing, while his wife was reading the scripture, and he whispered in my ear, that's enough stories. Uh, <laughs> Grand Chief of Quebec Crees, former National Chief of the Assembly of First Nations of Canada, born on a trap line in northern Quebec, went to residential school and did well academically, was admitted to McGill University uh, where he studied some law and Trent University where he studied some economics, both prelude to uh, and, and to go to seminary, it's necessary to have preliminary studies, of course. Uh, he went then to seminary in the United States, and he has been more recently awarded doctorates by both Trent University and the University of Toronto. A highly accomplished Canadian, many awards, but I know him well enough to affirm that it is his own redemption in Jesus Christ that is the most cherished aspect and experience in his life. And so uh, on Friday and Saturday, he made presentations to us about uh, the truth and reconciliation that we are going through, always pointing in a positive direction about the partnerships and the work that we could be doing together. And so today he will continue some of that with respect to the environment, but also as a witness to Christ and an encourager to local First Nations to join us here in worship on a regular basis as we build on the imagery of Christ in this place and in our hearts. And so, Dr. Kuhnkamp, take it from here. Uh, good morning. I'm not going to tell any more secrets to Brian. <laughs> Amen. <laughs> no, I've had a, I've had a wonderful time uh, this weekend. I want to thank uh, Reverend Cheryl, of course, uh, Reverend Bill, and Reverend uh, Don, and Reverend Martha. Any other reverends here that I forgot? <laughs> I don't know. <laughs> But it was a great event, and, uh, <clears throat> and I really enjoyed myself. But this, but this morning, I want to do something different, if I may. And I've asked if I could do this, and, and I will. So today, it is my honor and privilege to share God's word with you. I do not believe in chance. I do not believe in circumstances. But I do believe in divine appointments. I am here to tell you that God has a plan for our nation God has a plan, a great plan for you and I. The Bible says, this is what my wife read, For I know the plans I have for you, declares the Lord. Plans to prosper you, not to harm you. Plans to give you hope and the future. You know, the enemy, the devil, is out to steal, kill, and destroy. But Jesus said, I am come that you might have life. That you might have it more abundantly. 
That's in the new uh, King James Version, John uh, 10, 10. There is an attack by the enemy on our families, an attack on our children, an attack on our nation. The only hope for our nation is the gospel of Jesus Christ. What we need are men and women, young and old, who are full of God's word. We need men and women, young and old, who are full of the Holy Ghost and fire. Did not the Apostle John say in the Gospel of Matthew, chapter 3, verse 11, I quote from the New King James Version, he said, I indeed baptize you with water unto, unto repentance, but he who is coming after me is mightier than I, whose sandals I am not worthy to carry. He will baptize you with the Holy Ghost and fire. We need men and women, young and old, who are, who are not ashamed of the gospel of Jesus Christ. Apostle Paul wrote in Romans 1, 16, which is what my wife read. It says, For I am not ashamed of the gospel of Christ, for it is the power of God unto salvation to everyone that believeth to the Jew first and also to the Greek. Again, that's from the New King James Version. I believe God's word can change you. And it can change me. I even dare to believe that God can touch you, that he can touch me. What I am sharing with you is God's word. It is not the white man's gospel. It is not the black man's gospel. It is not the yellow man's gospel. It is certainly not the red man's gospel. It is the gospel of Jesus Christ. I am here to tell you, only the word of God can change the heart. Only the word of God can change the character of a man and a woman. The Bible says, For the word of God is living and powerful, and sharper than any two-edged sword, piercing into the division of soul and spirit, of joints and marrow, and is the discerner of the thoughts and the intents of the heart. That's in Hebrews 4, chapter 4, 12, in the New King James Version. I can tell you, the world does not have the answers. The political parties do not have the answers. They do not have the answers to deal with a lost and a dying world. What we need are spirit-filled people in every sector of our society, in the business realm, in our schools, in our hospitals, and in our governments, and I dare say in our churches. You cannot have the answers if, you're, if you are running away from God, if you are only relying on your own wisdom and understanding. And if you are tearing down what the forefathers of this country had laid down as a foundation. The foundation of this country is built on the principles of the word of God. It is time to take back our nation for God. I have been to many political meetings. From the local level to the regional level to the provincial and federal level. And even participated at the international UN forums. But none can match, none can match a worship service where you allow the word of God to be preached and where you allow the Holy Ghost to minister to the people. I find that there are many motivational speakers and positive thinking going around. I am here to tell you motivational speaking and positive thinking only tickles the ears. Only the word of God can change the heart. Only the word of God can change the character of man and a woman. To deal with the social, cultural, and economic woes of today, we, be, we need spirit-filled men and women, young and old. Men and women, young and old, who dare to believe in God. Men and women who are full of faith and believe that with God all things are possible. That's in Matthew 19, 
Verse 26 in the New King James Version. So that the word of God must be more real to you and I. More real than the doctor's report. More real than the circumstances around you. You see, you and I cannot give what we do not have. Peter said to a certain man laying from his mother's womb, a man who was laid daily at the gate of the temple, asking for alms to them who enter into the temple. Peter said, Silver and gold have I none, but such as I have give I thee. In the name of Jesus Christ of Nazareth, rise up and walk. The Bible says that this man leaped up, stood and walked into the temple with him. The Bible says he went walking, leaping, and praising God. You will find this story in the Bible at Acts chapter 3, verse 1 to 10 in the New King James Version. Ladies and gentlemen, I want you to understand that we have been given the power of God. For the Bible says, but ye shall receive power after that the Holy Ghost has come upon you. That's what my wife read from Acts 1, verse 8, again in the New King James Version. Without the power of God, there is no solution. You and I have been given the power. Read Matthew chapter 10, verse 1, from the New King James Version. This is what it says. And when ye have called unto him his twelve disciples, he gave them power against unclean spirits, to cast them out, and to heal all manner of sickness and all manner of diseases. This word of God must be real to us. We have been given the power. You and I have all that we need. Jesus said, in his own words, he said this to us, and I quote. He said, Verily, verily, I say unto you, He that believeth on me, the works that I do, shall he do also, and greater works than these shall he do, because I go unto my Father. And whatsoever he shall ask, it says, in my name that I will do, that the Father may be glorified in the Son. And if he ask anything in my name, I will do. You'll find that scripture in John 14, verse 12 to 14, again in the New King James Version. So if you allow God to do a greater work in you, then greater work in you, greater work through you. Dare to cry out to God. Ask Him to touch you. Ask Him to change you. I'm not ashamed to say I ask God, touch me, fill me, because I know change starts with me. If you continue doing what you've always done, you will continue to get what you got. You and I need to step into what God has for us. Our words, our thoughts, our attitudes, our actions must change also. We need to renew our minds with the word of God. If you do not change what you are doing, nothing will change. And during a conference, I quoted this often. I said it's a form of insanity to do the same thing over and over again and expect different results. You know, I pray that we who call ourselves Christians will be known not just by our love, but will be said of us as found in Acts 17, verse 6, again in the New King James Version, that they will say of us, those who have turned the world upside down have come here again. I pray our faith will not stand in, will not stand in the wisdom of men, but in the power of God. As the scripture says, and I quote from 1 Corinthians chapter 2, verses 4 to 5, again from the New King James Version. It says, And my speech and my teachings were not with persuasive words of human wisdom, but in the demonstration of the Spirit and of power, that your faith should not stand in the wisdom of men, but in the power of God. I pray that we have the boldness of Peter and John. It will also be said of us that we have been with Jesus. And again, I quote from the Bible, from Acts chapter 4, verse 13. 
This is what it says. And when, they had, and when they saw the boldness of Peter and John, and perceived that they were uneducated and unlearned men, they marveled. And they realized that they had been with Jesus. I pray that we, God will give us boldness, not to be ashamed of the gospel of Jesus Christ, to dare to ask God, what would you have you to do? That he will open doors for you. That you will do great things because greater works will he do. That's what he said. And to believe in him that nothing is impossible. I want to strengthen you with God's word. And I want to thank you for giving me the privilege to share it. And I want to thank you very much for inviting me. And God bless you all. Thank you very much. Miigwech. We were having coffee almost a week ago, an hour in the middle of last week, and the schedule for today was to focus on God in creation, but in this church you can see the creation over the massive altar in the front, and I could tell in the coffee uh, that this sermon would not simply dwell on God in creation, but would get to the heart of the matter in our hearts, because he was checking me out. The United Church believe in the Father, Son, and Holy Ghost? Oh, yes. The United Church believes that we are redeemed in Christ? Oh, yes. I could see where he's going. I knew what he was going to preach. Thank you. Right. I have some thanks to offer. First of all, to the embrace of this congregation and to St. John Stevensville for hosting, uh, the embrace for sponsoring and the church for hosting this morning. Uh, Silver Spire and First Grantham Church for also hosting parts of the conference. Add my comments to those addressed to Cheryl. Uh, we asked her to come this morning to be recognized because it uh, is a project that began this conference and this day uh, during her ministry in this church. And uh, as it turned out at the conference itself, uh, the registrar tells me that half or more of the participants were actually from Cheryl's church. Uh, and so Cheryl uh, gets results. We also want to acknowledge and thank Martha for seeing it through. Martha's ministry is to expand our presence and the presence of the ministry of Christ in greater Fort Erie, and we are grateful to her for the work done in this connection. Roy Rivers and his brother Jim, Roy <clears throat> and others who got the art uh, ready for exhibition, the Fort Erie First Nations who have contributed in many ways, and the drummers especially. We want to thank Val Spear, the registrar of the conference, uh, Victoria McDonald, who did some chauffeuring and other erranding around for us, and all of the workers, Glenda Doan heading it here and others with her, and also at the other two churches, and most especially uh, a thank you to the Kuncum family, uh, to Matthew and Marianne in particular. Don. Let us now receive our morning offerings.
come before you as your people. We thank you for the ways in which you have empowered us by your spirit to make a difference in the world about us on behalf of Jesus, Jesus Christ. We thank you for your many gifts. And from those gifts, we give something of ourselves. And we ask that your blessings would not only flow onto these gifts, but through them as well. Lord, bless us and others through us. In Jesus' holy name, amen. As we enter a time of prayer, uh, I want to let the uh, congregation know that uh, tomorrow morning there will be a funeral here at 11 o'clock for Phyllis Golding, and our prayers are with the Golding family. Also that uh, Leona Bateman is in the hospital, although I told her not to go back into the rose garden or the tulips where she's fallen before, she fell again. And, uh, and so we pray for her, and uh, I don't think it'll be a speedy recovery, but we'll pray for that anyway. Are there any other prayer requests? Okay. Let us approach God in prayer. Oh God, hear my prayer. Gracious God, as we come before you this day, firstly, we give you thanks for Matthew, for his words and even his ministry, for the fact that even in secular affairs, he's a prayer warrior, accomplishing much together with you. As we come before you today, we give you thanks for your gift of identity. You are the author of who and what we are. You have created us in your own image. We confess that we sometimes forget that. Lord, we don't often live out your image within ourselves, and we impoverish ourselves because of it. We confess that we don't see your image in others, and so we don't honor others with respect, the respect that they are due. And so much is perpetrated from one upon another because we do not see your presence in each of us. Not only is your human creation made in your image, but you have made us in diversity and beauty with a variety of colors of black and of yellow, of white and of red, and even more. You have made us of differing genders and ages. You are a great artist, giving us a vibrancy of cultures to draw us together and to help us to celebrate life. May our language, our art, our music and dance bring honor and glory to you. You made all of this, you made all of us, and you call it and us very good. And yet, Lord, there is reason for your people to cry 
As Robert Burns said, man's inhumanity to man makes countless thousands mourn. And yet we know that you hear the cries of your people, of the missing Atawandaran people from the Oneagra area. And so we pray for those who cry in our world, whose cry is for human justice amid injustice, who cry amid natural calamity. We pray with and for those who cry at home in Canada due to a loss of family, even a loss of family members of missing and murdered Aboriginal women. We pray the, with those who cry due to mistreatment, treatment that is less than human and far from humane. We pray with and for those who are challenged in body and mind and spirit. And we pray for your healing hands to be upon all of us. We pray for those whose anxiety is for economics in their home communities. We pray for those who may not participate in the goodness that your creation affords. And yet, at Easter, Lord, you call for life in its fullness. And as Jesus rises from the grave, you call us to new life to awaken that which we have allowed to die within us for lack of your spirit, to awaken that which we have allowed to die between us. You call forth better relations between the human and the divine, between the peoples of humanity. You call forth that all may be one as you are one, Aquenia Tetewa Neren. We call forth all our relations and new relations. We call forth your heart to be among the heart of our Inukshuk and the heartbeat of drums. We need the power of your spirit working within us to draw all people together. And Lord, as we come before you today, we pray for the Golding family in the loss of Phyllis. We thank you for her faith and for the faith of the family in the face of death and resurrection. We pray for Leona and for her family. Our Energizer Bunny once again has to get up and move. We thank you that she gets up and continues to move, being knocked down so frequently. And Lord, we continue in prayer for Wayne as well, recovering from surgery. Amid all of these prayers, Lord, we look for your wisdom to inform our daily living. Lord, hear our prayers, and in your love, answer. Amen. Thy holy wings, O Savior, spread gently over me. And let me rest securely through good and ill in thee. Hold me my strength and portion, my rock and hiding place. And let my every moment be
just a few things before we join together as we sing, they'll know we are Christians. Following the service, everyone is welcomed to join us in the fellowship hall. Enjoy the artwork, take your time, um, and, and join us with, in a simple meal of bannock bread baked by Glenda Doan and her crew, and three sisters soup graciously provided by Bev Hill. Now let's turn to our inserts and sing together. They'll know we are Christians by our love. Amen. 